Sure. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome Matthew Riley. Now, get this, Matthew Riley is a prolific author and novelist, and he's written quite a few novellas. Many of you would know the films Contest, Ice Station, Temple, Temple, Arena 7, Scarecrow, Hover Car Racer, and many, many others. He's got a new one coming out called Cobalt, Cobalt Blue. Uh, he sold, get this, 7.2. 5 million copies of his books. He has created a new film, which is out on Netflix as well, which is over 90 million households, I believe, at the moment. That is the current numbers that I've got. Uh, could be over 100 very, very soon. Called The film is called Interceptor with Luke Bracey and El- Elsa Pataki. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go and watch it. I am saying that because I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> at the time of recording this, I promised him that I will watch it today for him. But Matthew, man, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Hey, Jay. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here, my friend. How are you doing? How's the feels going for Interceptor? Your new book's coming out. You're a very busy man. So how are you feeling about everything? It's been good. You know, uh, Interceptor came out June 3 and uh, zoomed to number one around the world, which was just fabulous. And and it's been out about a month now. And, and that's about your lifespan of a movie, whether it's in a theater or on Netflix. And yeah, we're, we're almost at 100 million uh, households viewing it, which is just fantastic. And, and yeah, when I was, uh, when I was editing Interceptor, I'd, I'd written Cobalt Blue. So I delivered that. And now we're looking at having it come out in August. So it's been a nice, nice time to release stories for me, one in June and another one in August. Have you had like much downtime at all, like much of a break or you just go from one project to the next? Uh, this last year and a half, gone from like the one impossible labyrinth finishing the jack west series to filming interceptor and cutting it and uh, scoring it and then just polishing cobalt blue so now i am resting i am stopping uh and actually just got just got covid for the last five days so maybe that's the universe telling me to take a break on your birthday right yeah yeah i got to stay at home in bed on my birthday happy birthday and nonetheless, Thanks. even though you did get COVID, I mean, what a birthday present, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's been been pretty good. And you know, we filmed Interceptor in, in Sydney, Australia, during a little gap in COVID when Sydney was open. So, honestly, eventually COVID caught up with me. I'm I'm vaccinated and boosted, so it's been like a flu, but still enough to knock me on my back for three days. But to be honest, I got to make my movie, get it all done. So if getting COVID at the end of it's the price, I'll take it. <laughs> it's a good price, good price to pay, in my opinion, mm. to be honest. But I want to get to Interceptor and Cobalt Blue in just a moment. But I wanted to ask you, this is my official first question. What does success look like to you? Success to me is actually being able to do what I want when I want. Uh, you know, when, once I was able to pay my rent and feed myself with book royalties, I quit my job at the law firm I was working at. And now if I feel like writing a script or writing a novel, I write the script or I write the novel. And now with having made Interceptor, hopefully make a movie. So success to me is just, just having control of my schedule. That that's, uh, it's, it's not a money thing. It's not a number uh, it's not a house or a car. It's control of my, my schedule, my time. How hard was it for you to go from working in the law firm to then being able to support yourself through book royalties, getting your, your first book published? How hard is it or how hard was it for you to be able to create this current life that you've got? Uh, it, you know, it was easier for me than I think it was for my parents. I think my parents were a little frightened that, that I had to be self-sufficient uh, to make it work. But I, I felt as long as I could keep a certain amount of dollars coming in, my, my tastes are not extreme. As long as I could cover my expenses, I, I could make it work. So I didn't really enjoy working at an office and working for other people. I very much am built to work for myself. Uh, so yeah, I think it was easier for me, but for, I knew my parents they told me later they were very worried. 
did you ever stress at all like i'm not gonna make this happen were there any of those kind of moments for you not really not really ice station was the book which took off and and that first royalty check from ice station uh, was a good one uh and i'd already written the next book temple yeah. and it quickly sold to publishers in the us uk and germany and so i got a good check for that and that really set the ball rolling and once i was able to do that as i said success for me is having the time to do things in my own in my own schedule and so then i just really got my skates on i was a full-time writer so i could write area seven i could write scarecrow i could devote myself to make myself better at writing so once you it's it's rolling the snowball up the hill once the snowball gets over the top it actually gets bigger and bigger of its own momentum yeah did you with contest did you i think i i read somewhere that you self-published that one mm. and you did something rather interesting you actually you got it in bookstore a bookstore because back in i think it was 1996 that you published that one Mm. put it in a bookstore because book agents go there or acquiring editors, they go there and they pick up books and then they like for actual publishers. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So that was the plan. I couldn't make money self-publishing contest. It was all about just getting it noticed. And I actually figured that good publishers go to bookstores. They go to see what, what's on the shelf. They go to see, you know, what the competition's doing. And my hope was that a good publisher would spot it. And Kate Patterson from Macmillan did exactly that. That's how I got discovered. And you've been working with them ever since, right? I've been with Macmillan ever since. That's right. 20, 26 years later. So what led you or what made you want to become an author in the first place? I was, I was reading Michael Crichton and Tom Clancy. And I loved the pace of Michael Crichton, Jurassic Park, Rising Sun, Great Train Robbery. But I loved the geopolitics of Clancy, you know, the hunt for an October, clear and present danger. And I wanted a book which had the pace of Crichton, but the geopolitics of Clancy, and I couldn't find it. And so I thought, well, I'll write it myself. And I just wanted a book which was faster, a book which just went from action scene to action scene to action scene and just never stopped. I didn't want a book which had an action scene and a rest and an action scene and a rest. And Contest was my first attempt, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I think in my heart of hearts, I always wanted to direct action movies, but the movies I wanted to direct were just way too expensive for anybody to give me the money to do that. And so with books like Contest and then Ice Station, the second one, I was writing these giant action stories, which I couldn't possibly pay for as movies, but as fast paced novels, they were perfect. And, and I found that I loved it. And, and so uh, I, for me to go and write a book on like a Sunday afternoon, that was just a joy. It was a hobby that could become a career. How old were you when you wrote Contest? I was 19 when I started it and 20 when I finished it. Wow. And then how old were you when iStation took off? Uh, 23. So you're uh, 20, 24. Yeah, 24. So I'm 25 at the moment and my very first book is about to be published in the US in September and there was a right. whole journey to get that published. It's nonfiction, so it's not a novel or anything, but for someone that is facing rejection or they, they want to do something that obviously is their passion, they're really, really excited to do it, but they don't, they're facing like all those no's and setbacks, which I believe you faced as well from a bunch of publishers. Mm. What advice would you give to them? Honestly, whether it's in books or movies, you know, rejection is actually the norm. You, you have to get used to it. If you, if you don't pick yourself up, dust yourself off and get, get back into it, then you'll have to find something else to do. Um, you know, you even said to me when we were speaking off air, you spoke with Luke Bracey recently, you know, actors, even these successful actors, they've had countless rejections at auditions. You just need to have that confidence to keep going because I've had many more rejections than I've had successes, but when the successes come, my God, they're big and they're worth it. They're so satisfying. So yeah, if you're young, I mean, the advantage I had was I was 24 when I got, when iStation came out and took off, 
you know, you're 25. A lot of people don't even think about writing a book until they're midlife. So the advantage of doing it young is that you've got plenty of years to get better at it and enjoy it. But yeah, there, you're going to get rejections. And when your book comes out or when your movie comes out, there are going to be people who don't like it too. There are going to be reviewers. There's going to be social media. And uh, as long as you know, 75, 80% of people like your stuff, you'll probably make a pretty good career out of it. Which kind of leads me to my next question. How do you know that your work is actually good? Ah, that I don't, I never say my stuff is good. I say that my stuff has found its audience. Yeah. And I think it all depends on what you write. I write big action stories. So the audience for that is a large mainstream audience. If you want to write, say, a novel, which is about a deep analysis of the human condition, that might be a bit slower, might be a bit more cerebral, the audience for that is smaller. It's a selective audience, might be an older audience. You might call it the award reading audience. Chances are you're not going to sell millions of copies because that audience isn't that big. But if you find that audience, then you've succeeded. And so I never say, oh, that book is good. I say that book, if I think that book was successful because it found the audience it was supposed to find. If you want the biggest audience in the world for books, write romances. Yeah. But I don't love romances, and I think you have to write what you love. You've written a nonfiction book. Whatever the audience for that book is, that's the audience you want to find, and that's when you'll discover if you think your book you know, is, quote, good or not. You, ultimately, you're the judge of it. You've just – any sort of book or film, it takes, it takes this leap of faith of saying, I've written this thing, I've made this movie, I think it's good, now I'm going to put it out there and see if the audience that likes it, likes it as well. Um, Interceptor, my movie is a really good example. You know, it was a small film, but it's fast, it's furious, it doesn't stop. Didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of enthusiasm. 100 million households have now watched it. It's found its audience. And what have you, what is, what is your relation, relationship been with the critics that say that your movie or your books aren't up to standard. You know, I, I experienced it with iStation. So Contest was the first book which I self-published, but iStation was the first one to get a mass release. And iStation was just this new kind of book. It was fast. It was nonstop. It was just a bulldozer of outrageous fun and action. And sometimes the establishment don't like it when you come bulldozing into their realm. <laughs> and so you have to expect that there are going to be critics who don't like it. The audience loved it. And I'm part of that audience. I'm the kind of guy who would have read Ice Station. I'm the kind of guy who goes to watch Marvel movies and James Bond and Star Wars. So when, when a movie like Interceptor comes out, Interceptor as well, it's a new kind of movie. It is faster than anything else you've seen. Everything I put into that movie was designed to make it as fast as humanly possible. Just like I Station, 24 years ago, there are, there are critics and people who go, oh, I didn't like this movie. I mean, oh, my goodness, it was just so, so fast and almost incoherent. And I'm like, well, the 100 million households who watched it really kind of liked that. They wanted that. And so, again, critics are a funny thing because – do people actually look to critics now to guide them to watch a movie? And I would say not as much as they used to. We, newspapers are not as powerful. Even social media has sort of got a troll problem. So how do people find out about movies? They, they sort of keep their ear to the ground and then they go and try them themselves. With something like Interceptor as a slight tangent, Interceptor was on Netflix. It wasn't on at movie cinemas. It People could have it zapped into their home. The thing about Netflix is that it's a very Darwinian world because the audience on Netflix can turn you off. Netflix know if you turn off their movie after five minutes. Mm -hmm. They told me, we'll be measuring the number of minutes people watch your movie. And they even know how many people finish Interceptor. And Interceptor has a very, very high finish ratio which Netflix knows. So 
Netflix is a brutal marketplace because if your movie does not have the goods, the audience will turn you off. So to your question, critics, they're out there. I don't think they're that influential. And I think the audience has now got to a point where they like to decide for themselves. How long did it take you to get in, uh, Interceptor made? I wrote the script in 2017. Uh, we filmed it in 2021, came out 22. So from writing to completion, five years. Um, it really hotted up at the end of 2020, though. We, um, that was when Elsa Pataki signed on to be on board, and then we were moving pretty quick after that. Was it always going to be with Netflix or did you pitch it to different studios? No, no. We were looking to get it independently financed. Um, the key was that I had to direct it. And we even had a big mini studio in Hollywood offer to buy the script. The script is very strong. And they offered to buy the script, but they said, we don't want Matthew Riley to direct it. And, and I said, no. I said, it's my script. If I don't direct it, I'm taking my bat and ball and going home. Uh, and so we... I would have I would have directed it for anybody, but when Netflix said they'll do it, I was like, "Love Netflix, fine by me." And this is your first movie you've directed, right? Yes, yes. That's that's why nobody wanted to do it because nobody likes a first time director in Hollywood. First time director with this big of a project and this amount of money, right? Like, do we trust you enough? <laughs> How did that that's, make you feel? Well, that's exactly what you have to do as a director. You know, a, a director is given, you know, millions of dollars uh, under their stewardship and they have to deliver a good movie. And it's hard. Directing is a very, very difficult thing to do. And the only way you know if you can do it is by doing it. I was lucky I had three producers who guided me through the process and who trusted that I had, it sounds such a cliche, a clear vision, but they, they could see I had a clear vision for the movie and that's, they backed me and they vouched for me. And so I directed it and now it's done. I, I made a fast paced action movie. You did man. And far out. <laughs> like I know I haven't seen it. So I've seen the trailers and I've spoken with obviously Luke Bracey about it. And I, I think from what I've seen in the trailers, it looks really, really just stellar the quality of it everything and i've i've heard from people that have reviewed it in a positive way they've said to me that it just doesn't stop like from the the moment it starts it keeps on going and building and building and building into the very very end and um <laughs> what was the most challenging part about writing a film like that man well the thing with interceptor is i had to keep the budget down for me to direct it they, they weren't going to give me 50 million or 100 million dollars uh, it was always going to be a smaller amount. So I had to keep the story largely contained. And so Interceptor takes place on this remote uh, seaborne Interceptor platform called SBX-1. Uh, and so the hard part was just keeping the story contained and just making sure something was always happening. As soon as my heroine, played by Elsa, um, as soon as she gets out of one dilemma, she's into another one. Then she's out of that one, she's into another one. And so it had to just be this rolling series of dilemmas and I think that's what the audience loved. The audience was, when they sit down at the end of the day, they're looking for something which takes them away from the real world and shows them a good time. And what I created with this heroine that Elsa plays is just this, this woman who will not give up. She gets shot. She gets cut. She gets beaten up. She gets dropped in the ocean. And she just keeps coming back. And it's just fun. And and. Uh, it, it, it's been fa fabulous seeing audiences just embrace that. Um, so, yeah, it, it's keeping the pace of the story moving. Uh, that was the challenge. Did you always want Elsa to be the main hero? We, you know, we went to a few other actresses before Elsa. Uh, again, many are hesitant to work with a first-time director, yeah. uh, but Elsa was not. And given Elsa was game to work with me, I was thrilled. So, And as it turned out, she was amazing. She'd taken 10 years out of the movie business uh, to raise a family with her husband, Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. And for Interceptor, she got into like Linda Hamilton shape. I mean, she just has these biceps and shoulder muscles and she made herself into this army captain who is just tough. And I literally can't see anybody else 
doing that or being in the role. She she threw herself around, diving on the floor, rolling around, fighting with the stunt people. Um, I, it's a funny thing. I every every decision you make in life leads you to here, and yeah. it's somehow brought Elsa Pataki and me together. And she had a point to prove as an actress, and I had a point to prove as a storyteller. And we made a pretty awesome team. What do you think makes a memorable story? Ooh. Well, I think the first thing is has to be something new. Yeah. It has to be something you haven't seen before. And I think this is part of the reason Interceptor took off and took off so quickly. I mean, I've got the poster here for Jurassic Park behind me and, and on my little shelf here, you know, I've got the T-Rex attacking the, the Ford uh, vehicle. I think Jurassic Park was just a titanically original story. People were like, oh, my God, they've brought back dinosaurs into the present day. That's interesting. I want to go see that. With Interceptor, the premise is that the bad guys steal 16 Russian nuclear missiles and fire them at the United States. And Elsa's character is stationed on this Interceptor missile facility, which can shoot down nuclear missiles. Now, when I discovered that America had Interceptor missiles that can shoot down nukes, I thought, that's really interesting. And I think this is the first step for getting people to, to, for a good story, is it has to be something new. And there are so many stories that you have to be so new, it has to be interesting. And when people flicked on Netflix and saw this poster of this woman hanging from a, you know, a, a, a ocean going rig with missiles flying around her and that said, you know, a lone army captain has to shoot down 16 nuclear missiles with interceptor missiles, they went, oh, that sounds new. So the first thing is you have to be titanically original and then you have to tell it well. You have to tell it in a modern, I think, fast way. And, and that's what I did. But the first step, for, I mean, even you know, look at all the stuff behind me. I've got the Die Hard Tower, you know, terrorists take over a building. That's a nice new idea. Um, other things, I've got, you know, Indiana Jones on his horse right here going after the Ark of the Covenant. That's the original Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, again, going after big treasure, which may, may, may be the source of huge power. There's something intrinsically interesting that has to suck people in to want to read or watch your story. Are you ever worried for yourself that you won't come up with something new? No, nah, no. Nah. My dad's worried about that. I, I, he, he says, yeah, why, why do you put all, so much into one book? Why don't you do it over two or three books? And I'm like, no, nah, I read a lot. I read a lot of nonfiction. I watch a lot of documentaries and I travel. And that's where you get new ideas from. Um, even on Instagram, I, I follow these like archaeology sites on Instagram. And they show me these weird and wonderful places that I've never seen before. And then I can go and travel to them or visit them. And that'll always give me something to write about. So, no, nah, I'm not worried about that. Do you have a specific creative process? Does it change for every book? Yeah, it's different for everyone. But the key thing is just uh, reading a lot. Uh, I, I've read nonfiction books, you know, whether it's history books on Henry VIII and Elizabeth I and the Islamic Empire and chess and all of those books went into my novel, The Tournament, mm. or even... Even the Scarecrow books like Ice Station or Area 7 or Scarecrow, I was reading about the Marine Corps, uh, the exploration of Antarctica, the, the ice stations that are in Antarctica. Um, reading about these places gives you more material for the stories. And, I mean, I, I rarely write stories that are set in the cities I live in. I lived in Sydney for a long time and now I live in Los Angeles. Uh, I, I like to escape when I write. So I tend not to set them in my hometown. Um, and sometimes I just write science fiction, you know, like hover car racer with hovering cars in the future uh, or the secret runners of New York with a little bit of time travel going to New York, 22 years in the future and finding out that New York somewhere between now and then got trashed. The question is why? So yeah, if you, if, if the real world's not good enough, just jump into your imagination and go sci-fi. The labyrinth one interested me when I saw the yeah. the cover of that. I'm like, oh, he's he's way in my my element now. <laughs> well that that one was that one was set in advance. When I did Jack West and Seven Ancient Wonders and 65432, 
the final book, I said, I'm going to set the whole last book in this massive giant labyrinth. And it's got to have the biggest booby traps I've ever done. That was the challenge for that one. I don't know if you can spoil it as you end up getting out of the end. All I can say is it's the last book in the series. So yeah. there, it's the final book in the seven book series. And people have said, will you write any more? I said, no, I'm, I'm done. That, that's it. So How do I, won't you know say, I won't say what happens, but I will say it's the last book in the series. How do you know if you're like really done though? Ah, uh, I suppose you, well, with the Jack West books, I wanted to look at all of the strange ancient places of the world from the pyramids to Stonehenge, to Easter Island, to legends like, you know, the Siege of Troy, uh, to the Great Sphinx. And I linked them all together. And by the end of the One Impossible Labyrinth, I felt I'd done them all. So <laughs> I don't think, and I don't know what I'd call an eighth book anyway. What would I call it? The zero something something? So nah, I'm done. It's uh, it's very rare to finish something. When you do a series, the Scarecrow books can go forever like James Bond. But with Jack West, I like the idea that it's seven books and that's it. Um, and I'm satisfied. Seven's a good number. Yeah. Seven's a large number too. <laughs> I should have I should have started at three ancient wonders and that would have made it shorter. I mean, how many books have you written in total? Over 14, right? Yeah, I think I'm at like 17 books now. 17 books. And I'm still trying to get my first one done. Far out. <laughs> it's just the the level of creativity I see you have, it's inspiring for myself. Like I've always wanted to be a filmmaker as well as write stories, just being that story sort of sphere in some capacity. I love science fiction, I love mystery, I love thrillers, I love all those things. But for me, it's got to like captivate me in some way. Like you mentioned, the newness of it, like, oh, I haven't, haven't heard of that before. Like it's got to have like a, mm. a, a different sort of punchline as well. And the, the plot has got to, it's got to yeah. fascinate me to some, to some extent. I mean, I'm a curious person anyway. But if you're doing something that involves action as well as mystery, you throw in a couple of loopholes along the way, you've sucked me in. I'm like, great. I'm not going to take my pay my eyes off the page. <laughs> like, let's keep going here. That's the way I look at it. I think it's important as well to know that the audience is always evolving. And, and the audience in 2022 you know, they've watched a lot. They've, they've seen so much more than, say, the audience that read Ice Station in 1998. Yep. It's really interesting that Ice Station, that book, continues to stand up to this day, 24 years later. At the time, it was so bullet fast. Uh, it was so new. And the audience loves new. They love something which takes you to a new, sets a new bar. Yeah. And the funny thing is, though, that you then have to keep matching that bar. You have to then, if you've set the new bar yourself, you actually have to beat it. If audiences say, oh, that author, he, he or she, you know, doesn't write them the way they used to, you know, the actual answer is they're probably writing them exactly the way they used to. It's just that the audience has now evolved yeah. and they're expecting more. And so the audience in 2022, think about that. The audience in 2022 compared to the one that read Ice Station in 98, they've watched the Lord of the Rings movies so they can picture vast battle scenes. They've seen, you know, the whole Harry Potter movies. They've seen TV shows like Breaking Bad and uh, even Game of Thrones and, and even for, for, you know, its flaws in its final season. You know, there were several seasons of Game of Thrones which was unmissable television. And then you've got the, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So the audience in 2022 is used to a different level of storytelling. You as the storyteller, you have to respect that audience and meet, meet them at the level they're at because they are always evolving. And you're also competing with the level of attention span. And mm. these days it's gone significantly, it's reduced a lot. So 
Mm. Yeah, in order to keep their gaze on the screen for a long extended period of time, like for the film Interceptor, if they're watching from start to finish the, the whole time, you're doing extremely well because the right. vast majority of people are like, they start something, they get 10 minutes in, they're like, oh, no, forget this. And they they turn off because they're just waiting for that, that pickup, but they don't give it an, enough mm. chance for it to actually end up getting into the middle where it sort of picks up because some movies do that. Like some yeah. movies can have it be a slow start and then they start picking up. Like you just got to give it a chance. But these days, uh, unless you, you're you in that quick fire zone, it's interesting because like for iStation, it was quick fire. And mm. back then your audience probably would have been like, okay, we're not ready for this. But these days the, the audience might actually really be ready for it because <laughs> mm. they're all about that quick fire stuff. Um, but- yeah. The nicest compliment I got uh, with Interceptor soon after it came out was a buddy of mine watched it with his wife and his two daughters who were like 10 and 12. And he said, like always, they started watching it, the two kids, with their phones. And he said, after about three minutes, they put their phones down and started watching it closely and watched the whole movie. Now, could you imagine imagine being a 12-year-old kid right now? I mean, with so many things competing for your attention. And so the fact that my movie could grab their attention and hold them, that was the greatest compliment I received. And I, I thought about people doing that uh, around the world because you're right. It's different. You know, if people go to a movie cinema, you, you know, you, you commit to sitting in the cinema for 90 minutes or two hours. Yeah. But yeah, if you're watching something streaming, you're in total control if your attention isn't held. And so, yeah, if you're going to make a movie which has a slow build, Netflix is not for you. Yeah. The audience doesn't want that. Um, you want to probably release it in a cinema, but that the numbers of people who get up, go to the cinema, buy their expensive popcorn, buy their thousand dollar Coke, <laughs> it's, you know, pay for a babysitter and go and watch a movie. It's a smaller number of people. Yeah. You've actually got a major cost involved with going to the cinema, which is why I think it yeah. should still be important. I mean, what what are your thoughts around actual staying with cinema related movies and then going to streaming? I, I don't mind either way. Um, as I say, my, my mark of success is being able to tell the stories that I want to tell. And so if, if it's going to be in a cinema, you want it to get a big release. You want it to get marketing because that gets people to the cinema. I think the movie, um, everything everywhere all at once, which came out this year, for a movie which was not a Marvel movie, not a Star Wars movie, to get a cinema release and get people to go and see it, I mean, it had a lot of bucks behind its promotion. That's the kind of thing you want with a cinema release. Well, I myself am very happy with Netflix. I, I think Netflix's distribution uh, pipeline is astoundingly good. And, and Interceptor, I think, is, is proof positive of that because ultimately when you make a movie, you want people to watch it. Mm. And, you know, I've now got the data of how many people watched it and enjoyed it and finished it. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm agnostic. I can do streaming. I can do theaters. Uh, if I get to tell the stories I want to tell, they're going to be fast. They're going to be fun. And I assume people are going to enjoy them. So I hope they'll find their audience. I'm either way. With you. Yeah. I, I agree with you on that. And yeah, I mean, I, to find a movie these days in the cinema that isn't Marvel <laughs> or or something like that. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's the way the world is heading these days. But no, congratulations on Interceptor. I promise that I will watch it today as we're recording this, which is the 5th of July. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to send you like a message or email or something afterwards and and let you know I've watched it. Here's what I, here's my thoughts. But um, you're making me even more excited to watch it actually. Um, your new book, Cobalt Blue. Uh, I want people to yeah. get a copy of that too. When's that coming out? August the second. August the second, and it's uh, it's special. I mean, it's a superhero story, yeah. and the the original, this first edition, is going to be a a set print run. There are going to be no reprints, and it's got coloured text, and it's actually got coloured text for a reason because Cobalt Blue is one of several heroes and they all have codes, code names, Cobalt Red, Cobalt Green, Cobalt Gold. So the different characters are, their stories are told in different colors and it actually has a purpose in the story. So 
all future editions will just be regular books with print, you know, black and white printing. But this first one, it's going to be something else. It's going to be a really well-produced uh, hardback book. TV show, movie? So it, it, Cobalt Blue began life as a screenplay, as a feature film. Um, the basic premise is that um, for 35 years, the US and Russia have had a superhero each, but the US's hero was older. And on page one of the story, the US hero has died. And now the Russian one is coming to America to wreak havoc and kill the children of the American superhero who only have half the powers. Uh, and these are the cobalt colored, cobalt red, cobalt green. And the youngest one is Cobalt Blue. And so we're going to watch as this Russian superhero comes to America and just rips the country apart, trying to kill these young superheroes. And Cobalt Blue is going to be the last one left. It's, it's hardcore. It began life as a screenplay, and I thought it was so much fun that I could expand on it and make it a short book. So that's why this I did this as a book, and it, it, it lives very well as a book. But if I... If I get my movies done, Cobalt Blue will be a movie very soon. I can't wait to see it as a movie, but I'll let my imagination run wild when I actually read the book. Um, yeah. So I, for one, am excited once again. Matthew, I've got one final question for you, if you don't mind, because I really enjoy oh. this conversation. This is a hypothetical question. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they've got it all. We'll call it magic for sake of argument. We're going to let our imaginations run wild here for a little bit. Mm -hmm. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Wow. You know that I that I persevered to, to do what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was entertain people and show them a good time and make them smile and allow them to escape from their, their lives. And, and that's what I do with my books and, and now my movies. I take people away from, from their everyday lives for a couple of hours or a few days. But that's not something you just, you're not allowed to do that straight away. You have to go and make it happen. Yeah. And to get published as a novelist, to get movies made, you have to push up the hill a lot. And I, I said once that on my headstone, they should write, you know, perseverance. And if, yeah, if, if they were to show me the, the story of my life, what would I want it to say? It's that if you persevere, you do get to, you know, live the life that, that you dream of. Perfect send-off message. Thank you for persevering for our sake and for your sake too. Uh, and thank you so much for your stories, your, your wisdom and your advice as well. And for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thanks a lot, Jay. Thanks for having me.